an enum consists of zero or more variants, and it can only be one of these variants at any given time. To declare an enum, we use the enum keyword. Let's create an enum with two variants, A and B. We can now create an instance of this enum using one of the two variants, A or B. Well, that seemed pretty simple and meaningless. What's the point of using enums? Well, enums on their own aren't that exciting, but if you add match statements, well, I don't have to tell you how exciting that is. Well, actually I do, that's why I'm here. A match expression consists of pattern that lets us run code conditionally. Let's use a match expression with a newly created state. If we run this code, we're going to get an error. That's because the B pattern is not covered. Match expressions in Rust has to deal with every possible outcome, and right now we're only covering A, so we need to deal with B as well. So let's add another match arm for B. Let's put some code inside the blocks to execute depending on which match arm we reach. So far, this looks like something that could have been covered with an if statement and a boolean value, but what happens when we add a third state? Well, the first thing that happens is that we get an error, because we're not dealing with a C variant, and this is a really good thing. Well, not dealing with a C variant, but getting the error. This makes refactoring so much easier. Imagine every place that you're matching on state, you're gonna get an error there. So the compiler is actually telling you where you need to go and update the code, unlike if you would have used an if statement. So let's quickly go and fix our code. This looks like something that could have been done with a switch statement in almost every other programming language. However, enums in Rust are really powerful, so let's update our state to have a little bit more detail. Let's rewrite our state to be more akin to a game state, albeit a very basic one. We can now update our code to play through the state changes. The first state we have to deal with is the start state. From the start state we transition over to the running state. In the running state, we decrease the hit points by 25 for every iteration. Note that to ensure we're operating on the same hit points every time, we have to take a mutable reference, and then we use the asterisk to dereference this. Because we subtract 25 hit points for every iteration, it means we're going to reach 0 after 4 iterations. If we try to subtract from 0, we're going to get an error called attempt to subtract with overflow, so we have to deal with the state change when we reach 0. We can create a specific match arm for the running state where the hit points is 0. Note that it comes before the other state where we don't specify the hit points because this is more specific and the order matters. We can now transition to the game over state. Since the game over state has its own enum called animation with two variants, we can write two match arms covering both of these variants. Finally, we can write the last match arm where we simply break the loop. We can now run this and see the printout for every state. Well, wasn't that exciting, but we're not quite done yet. There's a few more things to cover. For instance, what's happening with that break statement over there? It doesn't have curly brackets around it. And what do we do with numbers? So let's have a look at that. Match arms, unlike if expressions, do not require curly brackets if there's only one expression in the arm. However, this expression has to evaluate to the same type as all the other arms. Let's match on a boolean value. This will not compile because the true arm returns a string slice and the false arm returns a number. 
However, if we change the number to a string slice and put a semicolon at the end of the match statement, this will now compile. So why do we have to put that semicolon over there? Well, that's because Rust has implicit returns. That means that the last expression in the function is going to be returned. And since our main function doesn't return a string slice, we have to put the semicolon there. And since match is an expression, that means we can use it to assign values. So far we looked at using enums and booleans in our match expressions, but what about types that we cannot write an exhaustive pattern for? For instance, strings or numbers. When it comes to matching non-exhaustive types, we can use something that's a bit of a catch-all called wildcats. Here we're using the underscore to match every value. We are now free to match only the values that we're actually interested in, as long as we do it above the underscore, as that works to catch all values. The final thing that I want to cover about match statements are ranges. Not only can we match on single values, we can also match on ranges, but it's important to know that the range has to be inclusive. That means 0 to 5, including 5, not 0 up to 5. And now you know about match statements.